Mr. Rogers. Question. What was the most important moment in your life? Who was the most important person in your life right now? You are. You are. Because all we have is this moment. All we have is this time. And this time, my friends, I like to think of in Advent is a time when Jesus is here and when Jesus is coming. When Jesus is here and when Jesus is coming. One of you all gave me a refrigerator back then. I'm not going to name names, but it's in my office. It says, Jesus is coming. Hi, Paul. I don't know if I can say that in church, but I'm sure one of you will tell me afterward. Jesus is coming, and he's come. Jesus is coming, and he's come. I like to think of the metaphor of the time between dawn and daybreak, that wonderful dichotomy when it's no longer night, nor is it rightfully day. There's a promise of light, but of course there's still darkness. We believers who've been baptized into Jesus and all this fullness and all this dwelling that God has in us. We here in this mortal realm, we await the day when we will meet God face to face. We're in the middle right now. We're living in hope of the light. Living in faith. When we think about it, we're so happy that it's dawn, that at least we can see some of the light around us. Gone is the confusion of living in the deep dark of night. And you know, we all get there. Those times, of course, when we're not fully dwelling in Christ, when we're not fully dwelling in love, when we're not fully dwelling in that which is deepest within us. We all know those times when we're worried and we're frazzled and we're anxious and we're out of sorts. It's when we try to make it on our own without giving God enough say in the matter. But the light is here, and gone are those days of aimless wandering when we are living deeply in Christ. When we live in the light, gone is the loneliness, gone is the fear. We draw near to Jesus and his promises of care, his promises of peace, his promises of hope. We know that dawn is near. Sure, it's not fully light, but it's brought, it's brought us a glimmer of light, the light of the truth to reveal the day. And we live in hope that the full light, the bright light, will be revealed in due time. So dawn and daybreak, I think, are these wonderful metaphors of the Christian life, of where we are right now. However, there's another very appropriate in the holiday season that puts a spotlight on a pregnant woman. For in pregnancy, there's the promise of a child when none is seen. Nine months are spent incubating and nurturing and preparing, and there's pain and there's discomfort, but there's also hope of brand new life that will bring hope and fulfillment and a new journey beyond our wildest dreams. Today we live in pregnant times. We're burdened, we're bothered, we're uncomfortable, but we're scared, and we're scared. But with that pregnancy comes a promise. How many women remember the hassles of pregnancy? And how many women would do it again? That's because in these pregnant times we have reason for expectation of what's ahead. For joy, for hope, for we know we are our end more deeply implanted in Christ, basking in the everlasting presence of the light will take us. And this promise, this promise of hope, is what you and I have not only been given, but are being asked to take into the world that desperately needs us. There's a chaplain serving at the University of Southern California, one of America's most prestigious colleges, full of the children of celebrities and moguls. And I wonder if we can guess what the number one topic is that students come wanting to discuss with him. It's not poor grades, it's not breakups, but it's in fact loneliness. It's loneliness. It's a lack of close friends. It's fighting back feelings of diminishment and inferiority. In fact, uh, the chaplain there says the, the, the class with the longest waiting list at USC right now is a class called How to Make Friends. Loneliness. Loneliness. I was at Dairy Queen last night with my kids. I know it takes kids to drag into Dairy Queen when it's 30 degrees out. <laughs> and, uh, and as we were there, I was chit-chatting with the woman at the counter, and I said, well, you know, uh, is this your career? And she said, no, I'm a student, and I do this, and I also have another job in which I drive, uh, 
I drive children to uh, to school in the morning um, because they don't like the bus. And, and I know that, that, that would be one good way to make friends is to ride the bus. But we live in an era where this is done regularly, that there isn't the interaction. People don't feel like they have the social skills to interact with one another. And we may chuckle at it, we may think, boy, that's odd compared to my day. But it's what's going on around us. There is a world that needs hope. There's a world that's lonely. And this is one of the things I think Jesus offers us as the body of Christ gathered. is a place for real relationship, as a place where loneliness can be scared off by this hope we have in Christ. The same chaplain of mine I want to mention to you, he, uh, he started years ago and um, would be called on occasion to the scene of the unfortunate tragedy of suicide, both successful and unsuccessful, at a rate of about once a month. But there is this ep ep epidemic of gloom, of doom and gloom on campus that these days he's called to those scenes at the rate of two or three times a week. Uh, is this is the USC University Spoil Children, right? Young, bright, gorgeous kids who have everything except hope. And this is why it's so important for you and me to be evangelists of hope. So important for you and me to share hope with other people. That famous book by um, Viktor Frankl called um, Man, Man's Search for Meaning, he was a uh, World War II concentration camp inmate. And he talked about having his clothes taken, having his livelihood taken, having his family been taken. But the only thing they can't take is your attitude and your attitude of hope. That's the one thing we can hold on to. And so the question I think for you and I in Advent isn't just how we embody that hope, but how are we called to a world outside of these walls to be beacons of hope, to share hope? In other words, who in your circle of friends needs encouragement? Who needs a card, who needs a letter, who needs a text? Is there a neighbor, a friend, a relative who needs to be befriended and encouraged and commended? How do we draw closer to that hope? By sharing that hope. What are we doing to cultivate in us better ways to receive and reflect that hope? We're coming off now of a couple of weeks of impeachment hearings, and there's quite an opportunity out there to spread some hope in the world. Many of us have been riveted to our TV sets these days, watching the understandably depressing drama of a federal government sorely at odds with its commander in chief. One side sees things one way, the other sees things the other way. One sees black, one sees white, the call was quid pro quo, the call was perfect. It seems like there's agreement on only one thing, and that is intractable division in our nation. Such vast chasms between red and blue, so big that God Almighty perhaps can't span it. How do we begin to breathe <coughs> hope into that hopeless place? Well, friends, welcome to Advent, because this is our season of hope. And we begin with the Advent idea that hope is real, that things can change. And we can look back at the myriad of things that many of us in some of our years have lived through, even perhaps civil rights, where we saw opposing divisive, uh, divisiveness and opposing sides. And who would have ever thought that we'd have gotten where we are today? We're not where we need to be. We're farther along, and we got here because of hope. Any progress begins with hope. The one thing people can't take from us, we're asked to embody. Things can be resolved. There can be a way forward. People are looking at you. People are looking at me as beacons of hope. And we begin by biting our tongue, perhaps, when we're tempted to give up hope. That means our counterproductive participation in perhaps a bipartisan squabble of bad mouth. In Jesus, we follow a leader who told us to pray for and bless our enemies. You know, the word to act, Advent gives us the sense that there's a world out there that we can't see that's operating, and we're supposed to live in that world and not in this world. Because in this world, of course, there's no hope. But in God, there is hope. And so in Jesus, we follow this leader who told us to pray for and bless our enemies. I'm sure I'm not the only one who's been shocked to see virtual and venomous attacks and rebuttals on social media, posts that are cutting and insulting and just plain mean. And 
they are written by Christians. Perhaps well-meaning, but certainly ill-fitting. And friends, this just shouldn't be. They will know we're Christians, not by our abrasive Facebook posts, but by our love. The change we're looking for in the world doesn't come from insulting our opponents. The change we're looking for in the world comes from strengthening ourselves. The strength we're looking for in the world won't come through name-calling, or demeaning, or through hate, but through love. Not through embodying this one who will come again, who will come again on Christmas as that crash is filled, as we will remember that. When we're baptized, we promise to respect the dignity of every human being. And this means finding the image of Jesus in everybody, especially our opponents. Where is that image of Jesus but in every human being? Now, don't get me wrong, I know it's pretty well hidden in some people, but we're to look for that image of Jesus in everyone. We know Jesus didn't take up arms against his enemies, he didn't organize a coup or armed revolts. No, Jesus loved those who disagreed with him. He loved those who argued with him, who condemned him, and he left it up to the Father to fight back, which he did by raising Jesus up. And so besides loving everyone, Jesus' only other job was to hope. And we, too, are to have hope that in every dark scenario, no matter how intractable or impossible it may seem, that there is hope. How are we finding and spreading hope around us? How is God revealing hope around us? Who is it in our lives that we're being asked to encourage? And this is so important. As many of you know, in our family, we battle depression at the moment. And that means coming alongside time after time again and encouraging and encouraging. Many of you are around little kids, and they keep making the same dog on the stage time and time again. And you've got to have the patience to pick them up and encourage them. This is when we live in God, when we're patient and we're not mean. When we, when we uh, answer uh, bad words with good words, this is to walk in hope because we know there's something greater behind us. How are we finding hope and how are we spreading hope? One final story. I went to see a cancer patient in the hospital a little while ago and we talked about hope. We talked about that book written by Lance Armstrong who first received notoriety for his exceptional bicycle racing skills, then he came down with testicular cancer, he lost his life, and he wrote this book about the journey, a really inspiring book, and he makes this observation. He says that for every form of cancer that's ever been discovered, there's been at least one survivor. Hope. We can have hope. Hard times we win. Peace is real. And it, my friend, is on the way. Jesus doesn't call us to join in with the crowd of doomsayers, parroting the popular opinion that we're on a down whole slide and nobody can stop. No, we are called to admit the seemingly insurmountable reality before us and roll up our sleeves and address it. Friends, the dawn is here. We know daybreak is just around the corner. In fact, the time is so short. So let us not lose hope in that light that is coming. Have faith God is at work. Spread hope to others. And may Almighty God give us grace to see the daylight soon arriving and give us the guidance and faith to give hope to those who most need it.